Welcome to the Director's Cut with East Lansing Public Library's director, Kristen Shelley. Welcome to the Director's Cut podcast. I am Kristen Shelley, director of the East Lansing Public Library. The library enriches, connects, and transforms lives through knowledge and innovation. In this new podcast, we will have conversations with various leaders who have made a difference in their communities. Our guest today is author Matthew Desmond. Matt is a professor of sociology at Princeton University and the author of four books, including Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City, which won the Pulitzer Prize, National Book Critics Circle Award, Carnegie Medal, and the Penn John Kenneth Galbraith Award for Nonfiction. Evicted has also been selected as the City of East Lansing, Michigan State University, One Book, One Community Program, which encourages the community and students to read the same book and come together to explore its themes and issues. Matthew was listed in 2016 among the Politico 50 as one of the 50 people across the country who are most influencing the national political debate. Matthew, welcome to the Director's Cut. Thanks for having me. First and foremost, thank you for writing Evicted for shining that brilliant light on housing crisis in our country. I mean, I've read it twice now. I read it when it was first out, and then I reread it for the podcast. And I will read it again, uh, because I believe I am moderating uh, our discussion when you come to the One Book, One Community event in East Lansing. So Evicted is nonfiction that reads like fiction, which is the type of nonfiction that I really glom on to, I can really get into. Sadly, the characters in your book are all real. And they are families, they are veterans, they're women and children. So many things struck me and surprised me about this book that I, and I have worked in inner city locations for well over two decades. And I don't so much anymore, but I did. I worked in inner city Columbus in libraries. And still things in this book shocked me. So Yeah, I, you know, um, when I started this work, I didn't have any idea how deep of a problem eviction was, how common it was, how um, uh, effectively and ruthlessly it, it overturns families and communities and schools. And I think that... Um, this is a it's a sobering book because we we're living in a sobering reality you know mm-hmm. um most renters below the poverty line today in america spend over half of their income on housing costs um and we've moved from a, a society where eviction was pretty rare and and drew crowds to a place where eviction is incredibly commonplace mm-hmm. um in the lives of struggling families today and the book tries to tell that story uh from the point of view of tenants and from the point of view of landlords. And I think what you get out of those stories um, is a, a clear sense of the human cost of this crisis, and you also get a clear sense that people um, are full of humor and guts and spunk in the face of adversity that a lot of us have a hard time comprehending. Well, that's exactly right. I was going to say, you know, growing up, I loved my home. And the comfort of that house, the happiness and the company I experienced and the sense of refuge and solitude at times that I needed from that house. And today is no different when I go home. I can only imagine, and I, and I don't know if I can fully imagine, not having that security and what that does to people, both children and adults. And yet Lamar, Lorraine, Arlene, and many of the others you write about seem resilient yeah, I think that, right, I, you know, the, the home is really the center of our lives. Mm-hmm. And, you know, whatever issue we care about, you know, the, the lack of stable, affordable housing is somewhere at the heart of that issue. You know, without, without a stable, affordable home, everything else falls apart. So, you know, if we care about giving kids a, a shot at realizing their full potential at school, then we have to stabilize their home environment so they not bounce from school to school and teacher to teacher throughout the year. You know, if we care about spending wisely, you know, we can face the fact that, you know, the top 5% of our hospital users, for example, consume about half of all health care costs. Mm-hmm. And those are, you know, unstably housed people with serious medical conditions. And so I think that that's, that is a clear and blunt reality. 
And it also is clear, a clear human truth, um, that when you do this kind of work, you're met with people whose gifts are on full display. Mm -hmm. And I think one of my favorite moments in the book is um, this scene where Crystal and Vanetta are uh, at this McDonald's, Mm -hmm. and the boy walks in, and he's like nine or something, and he doesn't go up to order food. He goes around to the table looking for scraps. You know, Mm -hmm. he looks like he's, he's having a tough time. You know, his clothes are dirty. He looks like he's been roughed up. And Crystal, who's 18 and homeless, you know, uh, and Veneta, who's barely a few years older than Crystal and also homeless, you know, uh, they look at each other and Crystal says, you know, what you got? And they pull their money, their coins, and they, they buy this boy lunch and send them on his way. Right. And it's just a beautiful moment. And I think the book is peppered with those kind of moments, too. It is. A, that is a beautiful moment. You re- you started this research on, in this book and you did the bulk of the research in 2008, 2009, which was at the height of the recession. Right. Has the problem of eviction, the causes, policies, the impact changed since you wrote the book? So for a long time, we wouldn't be able to answer that question. Mm-hmm. You know, the federal government doesn't collect national data on eviction. Um, it's kind of catch and, as catch can when it comes to numbers on it, mm-hmm. which is crazy. You know, I mean, what if we didn't know how many car accidents happened in America every year? How many people were diagnosed with cancer? You know, that's the state of what we know about eviction. You know, what cities have the highest and lowest eviction rates? Where's it going up and down? And so for the last two years, I've been a part of a team called the Eviction Lab, and we've task ourselves with building the nation's first ever database of eviction. Um, So we we collected 83 million eviction records. It goes back to 2000, and we released these in a in a website called evictionlab.org. So you could go to this website and really kind of look at the numbers in your own community yourself. So now we can answer your question: <laughs> How has eviction changed mm-hmm. since the foreclosure crisis? And I think there's two things to to think about here. One is that you know, for a lot of people, for people like Arlene and Lorraine. Their, their life is kind of a recession. You know, like, you know, they're, they're in a generational economic crisis. And so for a lot of folks, you know, come boom years and bust years, um, they're struggling immensely with poverty and housing insecurity. And so for, for folks like that, you know, um, they're still in a position today that they were in 2008, 2009. Eviction rates haven't changed that much since the recession. Sometimes they've gone up in cities, sometimes they've gone down a little bit. The nationwide pictures suggest they stay the same. And how high are they? Like, what is the rate? Mm -hmm. And what we know is, from our estimates, um, renters in America are evicted at higher numbers every year uh, than uh, the foreclosures at the height of the crisis. So it's kind of a foreclosure crisis level displacement for renters uh, every single year in America. I was going to ask you about the National Database of Eviction because you worked with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, correct, to get that up and going um, and to get that started. Yeah, several foundations uh, really put their shoulder behind this effort. The Gates Foundation, uh, CZI, the JPB Foundation, and the Ford Foundation uh, really kind of uh, joined forces to help us launch the project. Well, good, because I cannot imagine not having that data. I mean, that's important data for us to be looking at as a country and as a nation. It's nuts. And, you know, what the data shows is, you know, when you talk about the housing crisis or when you read the newspaper and you come upon a, um, a story about housing, it's often the same story, you know, which is, you know, inner city Detroit, Rents are going up, or it's really expensive to live in Seattle or Washington, D.C., and it is. You know, that's a really important story. But when you look at the eviction crisis, you see that the crisis is not just located in five or six really expensive cities around the United States, you know. Some of the highest evicting cities are places like Tulsa, Oklahoma, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Richmond, Virginia. These are places that are generally not talked about when we talk about the housing crisis. We're also seeing high eviction rates in rural communities and suburban communities as well. So this isn't just a coastal issue. It's not just an urban issue. Uh, This is an issue that's affecting communities all across the the country. 
Absolutely. And some of the statistics in Evicted that I found really fascinating was the the small amount of money between a low rent in an inner city Milwaukee and high rent in the in the city or a high rent area in the city, I should say. But all, but also, um, you know, we know eviction um, dispor- disproportionately impacts communities of color. And I believe this statistic is one in five black women will be will experience eviction in their lifetime compared to one in 15 white women. So can you share... Among renters in Milwaukee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Among, among renters in Milwaukee, exactly. Can you share with me why it is so important for a predominantly white community like East Lansing to come together to talk about the eviction practices and poverty and homelessness? Well, I mean, this is an American story, right? And I think that... Um, we might think, if we live in East Lansing, you might think, oh, this, this problem doesn't touch us. I wouldn't be so sure. Mm-hmm. You know, and so eviction is an issue that absolutely disproportionately affects um, low-income communities of color and women in those communities in particular. You mm-hmm. know, and, and um, you know, the face of our eviction epidemic is, is moms with kids, just kids running around all over eviction courts, you know, just go into urban housing court, you see a ton of kids. And so, you know, Evicted is a book that um, features the stories of, of black families and white families, too. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one in five of all American renters, all of them, uh, now spend over half of their income on housing cost. And so I think that we should care about this as we care about the nation. We should care about this as we care about kids and families and expanding economic opportunity. And we should care about this because, um, you know, this is, this is really a crisis that grinds against this fundamental picture, I think, of what it means to live in this country. And I think an image we have about America is that, you know, it's about having a bit of land. It's, it's about uh, owning a home someday, maybe investing in, from a, in a career from it or raising a family in it. And that's kind of central to the story about who we are as a people and a, and a nation, and eviction flies in the face mm-hmm. of that story. You know, it mocks that story. And mm-hmm. I think it's something that we should all uh, care deeply about. Yeah, absolutely. So can you share with me what needs to change and, or how can we make a, a difference? How can we help make this change? So I thought that this question might be on um, readers' minds after they read, a, read Evicted. And so um, with proceeds from the book, my family started an organization called Just Shelter. Mm -hmm. And you can go to this website called justshelter.org. And what it is is a kind of a clearinghouse that says, you know, I don't have all the answers. You know, I don't I don't know what's best for East Lansing. But someone that's been working on this issue a lot longer than I have does, right? And so it it highlights community organizations in all fifty states that are working to preserve affordable housing, you know, drive down family homelessness, child homelessness. And so if you go to the website, Just Shelter, you can click on Michigan and kind of find those people, connect mm-hmm. with them. And I think, I think they're your best resource for that, that kind of question. You know, I think we have to start demanding real leadership and political leadership on this issue. You know, this is the first um, presidential debate on the Democratic side where housing is really being talked about by many of the candidates. And I think this isn't, this isn't a, a partisan issue. This is a bipartisan issue. And it should be something we ask from our political representatives. What are you doing to expand opportunity in my community by stabilizing people's homes, mm-hmm. by providing people a sta- safe and affordable place to live? I think that should be something we start calling for as a country. I couldn't agree more. What was most surprising or inspiring or challenging or the challenging part of your ethnography? So there's an inspiring question and a challenging question and a surprising question. <laughs> and I yep. think that, um, you know, I didn't start this research um, because I cared about housing, frankly. I started this research because I wanted to try to write a different kind of book about poverty in America. Mm-hmm. You know, I... I was reading all these books about poverty, and they were only about poor people or poor places, you know. And they kind of 
uh, presented poverty as something that was isolated from the rest of society. And I thought, that's not how it works. You know, poverty is a relationship. It involves uh, folks that are struggling. It involves folks that are making quite a lot of money. We're mm-hmm. bound together. We're in this together. And there are winners and losers, and sometimes there are losers because there are winners. You know, how to write a book like that. And so I went after um, uh, a narrative device, really, mm-hmm. you know, that would allow me to try to write a book like that. And I thought, oh, eviction. You can write about eviction because you've got the landlords, you've got the tenants, and you've got a lot of different actors. Then I, sent, then I discovered, oh, we don't know anything about this topic. We don't know very much about it unless we live in communities deeply affected by it. And when I crunched the numbers, you know, the thing that really hit me over the head was just how common this is. You know, it's like in Milwaukee, one in 14 renter homes in the inner city is evicted every year. That means, like, if you walk down any street in inner city Milwaukee and look to your left and your right, you know, one home on each side of the street is gone by the end of the year. Mm-hmm. It's an incredible amount of instability. Mm-hmm. And Milwaukee's not even the top 50, doesn't even make the top 50 evicting cities list, you know? I mean, there are cities that approach like double or even close to triple the rates that Milwaukee has. So this is something, I mean, that, was, that blew me away. Mm-hmm. That's the surprising answer. Mm-hmm. The challenging answer is kids and seeing kids whose lives are just completely uprooted and blunted because uh, the lack of a stable home is so far away from, from their reality. And one of the most chilling things I think I saw in Milwaukee was um, I was spending time with uh, Arlene. She was a, a mom raising two kids in the inner city. Mm-hmm. And she, um, she's really the, you know, the person that I think really the reader gets to know the most in the book. And, um, and she was staying with a friend named Trisha, and Trisha moved suddenly. And it was, it was kind of like an unexpected informal eviction, so to speak, for Arlene. And one day, Mover showed up and just started packing Trisha's things. And her youngest son came home to the scene, you know. And Jafaris comes up. He's seven at the time. He's seven years old. Right. And so he comes up to what his home is at that moment. And he looks around. He sees all these strangers in it. They're packing things in a trash bag. His mom is running around trying to find, you know, the medication and the keys and, you know, the essentials that she's going to need for that night. That night she'll be homeless. And... Um, you know, Jafaris doesn't cry. You know, he doesn't ask a question or, like, run to get his favorite teddy or anything like that. You know, he just turns around silently and goes out to play. And I think it should disturb all of us if we have kids in America that are responding to those kind of scenes, mm-hmm. like normal scenes. Mm-hmm. The majority of people, I think, when I talk to them about evicted or talk about eviction with them, they don't relate how it affects the schools. And it, was, it must be tremendous upheaval for schools and children. It's, yeah, I mean, I was in inner city Phoenix giving a talk, and, you know, teachers came up to me afterwards. They were like, you know what? Most of our kids that start on day one don't finish on the last day of school. They have to move, and we never knew why. And, you know, I think there's been this narrative out there that, you know, poverty and instability just go hand in hand, Mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, poor folks, their lives are just unstable. People move a lot. That's just a false narrative. Right. You know, uh, low-income families are moving so much because they're forced to. And this isn't just a rhetorical point. We have statistical models showing that, you know, if you control for eviction, poor families don't move more than anyone else, you know. So, if we want more school stability, more family stability, more community stability, uh, we need fewer evictions. Absolutely. Absolutely. We need more affordable housing. Right. That's uh, equitable. Have you kept in touch with these families that you researched? Yeah. yeah. You know, you do this kind of work, and I think you fall in love with people, you know, mm-hmm. and you, you form friendships. And um, I'm an academic, you know, a teacher at Princeton, and um, mm-hmm. there's an idea in the academy that um, you have to have distance to write something objectively. And I think the academy has plenty of distance. Mm -hmm. You know, there's plenty of distance Mm -hmm. in the ivory tower. Mm -hmm. Um, I think uh, I'd like to see more closeness and more intimacy, actually. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see more people that teach in these these universities and write on these kind of issues have, 
you know, like the Western Union app on their phone and have numbers to folks that are really struggling in their directories. And mm -hmm. um, I think it, it changed how I think of it. You know, I think that, um, you know, my biggest teachers on these issues were the, were the folks I wrote about in the book. Yeah. Oh, yes. And I will say, I, you know, I cried with them. I celebrated with them. So absolutely, you get very much connected. I can only imagine living with them and researching with them and um, learning their stories much more in-depthly than I did through re reading about them, that you have that tenfold. Well, Matthew, I will say, uh, I believe that Princeton University is very fortunate to have you on staff as a professor. Um, we need more professors like you who have have a conscience and who, um, not saying that professors don't, but you certainly, certainly have, um, have it. And your students are very fortunate. I'm fortunate to, to meet them. And I think that, um, you know, there are folks at the university, um, you know, at universities all around the country that, uh, that come from low-income communities, you mm -hmm. know, that are deeply engaged, that are doing work in their communities on, on all sorts of levels. And so I think that I, uh, I'm, I'm part of that tradition, and I'm certainly part of the tradition of um, folks that are trying to um, bear witness, you know, bear witness to, um, to morally urgent questions in, in, in this country. And that's a tradition that includes community activists, and includes novelists and includes mm -hmm. uh, poets. And, and once in a while, there's an academic that sneaks in there. Mm -hmm. Of course. So, well, thank you so much for joining us today for this conversation on the Director's Cut. I look forward to having a longer conversation with you and the community on August 25th for our One Book, One Community events. And um, again, thank you. And thank you for writing and keep up the good work. Thank you so much. It was a really nice conversation. Matthew Desmond will be in East Lansing for the One Book, One Community events on Sunday, August 25th at 6.30 p.m. at the Hannah Community Center, where he will talk about his book Evicted and do a Q&A session with the audience. And on Monday, August 26th at 9 a.m. at the Breslin Center, where he will address Michigan State University's incoming freshman class. Both events are open to the public and are free. You can pick up a copy of Matthew's book, Evicted, at the East Lansing Public Library. You have been listening to The Director's Cut, an East Lansing Public Library podcast. 